So anyway, I'm just going to sort of uh, walk through this uh, this lecture a little bit that I outlined for you, and then I will get into uh, playing him and Coach Cole a little bit. So the first thing is there are a few like technical issues with the trumpet that you kind of always need to be thinking about. Um, so no matter where you are in your development as a trumpet player, there's like there's some daily maintenance things that you have to do to make sure that the instrument works for you. If if you neglect the daily maintenance, there are at least in my experience, it's been more of a battle with the instrument. Sometimes it just doesn't work quite the way we expect it to. So what I do, what I try and do every day, is I try and uh, run myself through a set of breathing exercises where I'll set a metronome. Uh, I start with quarter note equals 60, and I just do in for one, out for one for eight repetitions. And then I go up to quarter note equals 72, and I do that for in for one, out for three. Uh, and then uh, something I incorporated recently, I go pretty much directly into this, is the warm up that Tom Lee outlined in the last class. Uh, I had actually never done that before that class, and I just started doing it afterwards, and my range increased, uh, like just consistency up there was just better, so yeah, listen to what Tom says. Um, and then I go into like sort of a more of a warm, warm up you quote unquote, routine. So I start with uh, the first flow study from, from Chickowitz, and uh, just in half notes at quarter note equals 60, and I add a lip bend to the descending half step. And I worked all the way through this, this sequence, all the way down to pedal C. Because uh, I found that actually getting into the pedal range, especially early in the day, really helps me find uh, like an element of stability in my playing. Um, so yeah, having those pedal notes available to me right away, it just it adds like as I said, stability through all of the registers. Just everything seems to flow a little bit easier from that. Um, and then I go into uh, flexibility. I, I work mostly from the Charles Collin book. Uh, I know Irons is good. There's some good stuff in Arvins too. I prefer uh, I prefer the Collin though. It's just something that I've worked with for years, and it's just kind of it's nice for me. Um, and I also do uh, one of Chris Gecker's flow studies, and I've modified it to work on articulation. That's something that I'll discuss a little bit later in the lecture too. Um, and finally. I start with something musical, usually like a vocal piece. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, Schubert. I'll find something from one of Schubert's song cycles and I'll just like buzz it on the mouthpiece and play the right hand on the piano or play the, the vocal line just on the trumpet. And that sort of gets, that gets the musical mind going. Because uh, it's one thing just to play like technical stuff and to get the technique going. But until there's like, until there's artistry attached to it, technique really only does so much. Um, and this is where Arnold Jacobs comes in. So Arnold Jacobs was the principal tubist of the Chicago Symphony for many years, and he taught a number of students in the Chicago area as well. Um, and his, so he's kind of famous for the term wind and song. Uh, and wind and song, it, it, like in, in his sort of school of, of thought, he emphasizes that like artistry and like lyricism are sort of the most important things that like lyricism, artistry, and breath. If you have all of those things, the rest of the technique begins to follow. Uh, I don't totally agree with that. I think there's a lot of work you have to do on like individual aspects of the instrument, but I do think that's a really great place to start. Um, so what Arnold Jacobs and what his, there I call them disciples, um, would say are, uh, 
is that all music is essentially vocal music. Everything that we do on this instrument, we are essentially singing. We want to be able to be singing through the instrument. This, this piece of metal that we're jamming into our face can't really be separate from us. It has to be, um, it has to be an extension of our voice. It has to be something that is actually part of us. Um, so along those lines, I found that it's important to be able to actually sing the parts that I'm playing for. Like if you can have them in your head in such a way that you can really sing them and really express musically what you're trying to say, transferring it to the trumpet becomes almost second nature as long as the technique is there, which is why daily maintenance is important. So, um, and then yeah, again, even though it's not 100% true, like technical growth will definitely follow artistry and control of the breath. Uh, it's not always a linear curve, but if you start there, it creates an environment that fosters like a greater growth. Um, so now I'm sort of putting a little bit more analysis to this. So as we're like starting to, to play with more musical intent, we're starting to play vocal music. Uh, it forces us to make decisions. We have to start. Yeah, we have to start like making specific choices about what we're doing with our phrases, what we're doing musically. This isn't like technical decisions, but it's express. These are expressive decisions. Um, so the thing that's interesting about this for me is this is where we as individual performers can put our our stamp. Um, so like a lot of times we'll have. I mean, people will be playing the same piece. And the notes are all the same. We want the notes to be the same. But every performance of every piece by a different person, I mean, even every performance by the same person, will be different. There are, I mean, obviously, no two performances are the same. But even when it's when you have different people coming in, they each have their own, their own take, their own idea of what exactly the piece is supposed to sound like, where each phrase goes, where to emphasize, where not to. And, um, that's sort of what makes this exciting to me. Um, so there's a, there's a book that's actually really good that talks about this in a bit of detail. And that book is called uh, Sound and Motion. It's written by David McGill, who's the former uh, principal of the students at the uh, And in this book, he sort of outlines a lot of like specific things you can do to be musical. Uh, I don't think that having one cut and dry method is always the best solution. But this is like if you're looking for, for like more resources on that, that's sort of a good place to start. Um, for me, I sort of have condensed how I think about musicianship down to four points. And these are as follows. So the first thing that I try and do is I'll find, uh, I'll find places within the phrase that had the most harmonic tension, places where I'm resolving by a half step, for example. And I try and find the note that's the crunchiest, the note that has the most, that has the most tension in it. And I try and bring it out, I emphasize that tension instead of running away from it. So when you're looking at a new piece, sometimes it's helpful to go through phrases and even just with the recording and say, okay, this is a tension note, this is not. So I will, and like, choose where you want to emphasize that tension. Um, it can also help if you're going to do like a harmonic analysis of your piece, that can help you figure out where your tensions are in terms of the structure. But I don't think that's always super, at least for me, that hasn't always been super helpful. Um, but I know a lot of people who really enjoy that. And that that's like the greatest thing. So that's uh, what I'm putting out there. Um, How do you remember all of these moments of tension in your music? Well, I think you can write them down. But for me, because it's become sort of intuitive. Once you start, once you start to find these moments of tension, they are. The more you look for them, the more they become just apparent, just in listening and in. And if you have the piece in your head, they start to to become more apparent just but in the process of playing. Definitely marking, mm -hmm. making sure. I, I think that's that's definitely a good place to start. Um, yeah, like even. Like if you're, if you're starting a new piece, you can just go through the first page and just say, all right, so the, just mark out all of your phrases and say, okay, this, is, this phrase is going to here and coming away from here. And this is my note of tension in this phrase. And if you do that, even for like the first, peep, the first 
page of the piece, uh, it will again start to become more natural as you go through the rest of the piece. So, um, my next uh, my next guideline is choose to breathe in the most natural places possible. Um, there are a lot of places that you can breathe in almost any music, but a lot of them are are tricky. They, they can interrupt phrasing. They can do all sorts of stuff. So this is the part where planning is really essential. Uh, like when I, whenever I pick a new piece or start a new piece, whatever, one of the first things I do is I go through and I mark all the places that I would like to breathe, just as an outline for myself to, to try it. Um, and as I go through the process of learning the piece, sometimes that changes. The, the breaths will make themselves again a little bit more apparent as you go through. But Yeah, it's, it's really easy to sort of breathe in places that actually add tension to like to your both to your body and to the music. And the breath, I think the goal of the breath is to get the most air in the least noticeable way possible. Um, like the only times when you should notice a breath is when it's like a punctuation of phrase. There, there are times when like a phrase will, will dictate itself in such a way that there is a place to breathe really easily. And when you do that, it's, it seems natural. It seems like, again, this is going back to the whole vocal aspect. It's like you're, you're pausing in the middle of that, a comma or a, or a period. Um, so I think it's important to find those moments, to go through and take the time to find those moments. Because if you have them marked on your page, it's just one less thing to think about. And it just makes it easier to go on. Um, now, the third point is to pick your, pick your dynamics and emphasize them as much as possible. Um, so dynamics are all relative, and this is, this is really interesting to me too, that forte doesn't always mean super loud, pianissimo doesn't always mean incredibly soft, but it means that you have to make a contrast between every dynamic difference that you have. So if you start a piece at a forte that's a comfortable forte, and you have a piano marking, it doesn't have to be the softest thing you've ever played, but you have to be able to tell the difference. You have to be able to tell contrast. And that's the most important thing with dynamics. Um, the other thing about dynamics is, this is where you can sort of put your stamp on music as well, is a lot of composers and editors won't always be super specific about dynamics. They'll give you like a general outline, but they won't, they won't have a marking on every phrase, every note. And this is again, this is where you get to choose. You get to choose within the context of what the composer gives you. What do you want to change? What do you want to make your own? How do you want to add contrast where it isn't explicitly marked? Um, the other part of this is the fourth, the fourth general guideline I have here is to always have direction in your phrases. Uh, so music is never gonna, music is never one note at a time. There are no phrases, although that's not totally true. But very often, music is, is more about the line than about any individual note. And uh, it's never static. It's never, you just sit somewhere and stay there and never move. That, that doesn't really matter. Um, so as you're planning your phrasing, it's important to always pick somewhere either to go to or, or to move away from. So you'll have what I call sort of a high point in your phrase, which is often the note of the minor tension. And that's what you emphasize the most. And as you move towards it, it's important to have direction towards it. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're crescendoing into it, but that there is intention in the line. And that, that does come across in your phrase, even if there isn't like a specific volume change. Um, and same with moving away from it. Like you can add, there are other ways to add or remove tension other than the volume. Um, okay. And the next part of this is about learning music that's, that's really tricky and about making exercises work for you. Yeah. Can we take a moment and uh, have comments or uh, questions? Absolutely. Both here and virtual. Anybody have any thoughts? What's speaking to you today? Can you talk to Brexit direction necessarily just like change the volume or there is like any protection there. Are yeah. you what is that is that like a is that a conscious thing you think of when you're playing or is it more like a, a subliminal effect? 
It's kind of both. So I, I'm thinking about this more in terms of intensity than in terms of volume, and I think intensity is something that can be conveyed in a lot of ways. It can be conveyed with just like a little bit of shimmer, a little bit of vibrato on the sound, but there's all sorts of stuff you can do to, to add or take away intensity. And I think that it's something that, yeah, certainly it's important to think about. Um, and then the more you do it, it's something that becomes more intuitive. Uh, does that answer your question at all? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So to kind of keep going on that, uh, when you are going into a point of intensity or a point you want to emphasis, what is it that you would do, do like in your own personal thing? Okay, so usually, no, this is where it's interesting. Usually it is a volume thing. It's almost always a volume thing. Uh, it's not a big change, but it's um, it's just like a very slight crescendo into the note of that most tension, and you sort of hit that note with just a little bit more, um, again, a little bit of sparkle with just like a little bit of the water. And then you back away. I think that actually the, the biggest dynamic difference is evident when you back away from that. Um, well, actually, uh, so, um, virtual uh, people uh, who are virtual, uh, the question, if you did not hear it, was um, just uh, clarifying what does um, it mean to work towards the um, uh, the climax or the high point. What kind of things are is he doing physically or mentally to actually make that um, noticeable in performance? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So this is going to be in the wrong key, but this is a phrase from an aria that I'm working on, uh, Samson and Delilah from the Sasa. And there's a lot of chromaticism in this, but there are a couple of notes that really stick out as like the tension. So I'm just going to try and exaggerate those for you so that you can sort of see where I'm going from here. sort of sticks out and it makes itself it could be ugly in other contexts not in this one but it's something that you can't ignore and and as a performer again if you make it your job to make sure that no one can ignore it that's when people are going to like sit up a little straighter in their seat and just like really want to hear hear what you're going to do next um and sort of on that line the so if you're taking an audition, for example, for like a professional orchestra, this is the sort of thing that's, that sets candidates apart. When you end up in an audition, uh, for the most part, people are going to play the notes. That, that's not going to be the issue. People are going to have their excerpts now. And what's going to set people apart is like your ability to, uh, to play with that sort of expression, that sort of personal touch, and those could be sort of small details. Uh, and that's what a committee will notice when they're listening to you play in, in any sort of audition, whether it's professional or not professional. Um, and that's, again, that's the sort of thing that can, that can set you apart from whoever else is taking that. So, again, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. We have a great question here from Tom. Uh, yeah. When you make your phrasing decisions, have you already listened to someone else play a piece? Or do you want to make, first make your own decisions independent of what others have done? Oh, good, that's question. A good question. I think for me, it's a mixture of both. Um, normally, I have listened to other people play. And um, what I do is I usually try and find as many different recordings of people as I like, uh, that I like as possible. And to try and choose, 
like um, from those recordings, what they do and don't do, what the individual people do and don't do, that I like and don't like, and choose like the best from what everyone does. Because like chances, like there's only so many things you can do. Chances are someone has done something that you're going to attempt before. And if you can find which solution you like the best in performance already, that's kind of a leg up. But it's also an interesting exercise to just sort of go through with no idea what the piece sounds like necessarily. Get in your own head from listening to it, from just like reading the part and uh, to try and uh, sort of sort through your own ideas there first. So I think both, both approaches are, are good, but I usually listen first because I'd like to have that actual sound in my head before I start uh, approaching something. Excellent. Um, Any other uh, questions, comments? How do you go about like mentally preparing yourself for like, this song? Okay. So this is an interesting one. This is something that I really struggle with a lot, actually. Can you repeat the question? Okay. So Cole's question was, how do I go about mentally preparing myself to perform? Um, and actually, I've sort of addressed this a little bit in the next section of the lecture too. But there, there are two aspects to this. There is preparedness from like a technical standpoint, being prepared before you even go in. And then there's also a being in the moment aspect. So from the preparedness standpoint, is you want to have whatever you're, you're trying to perform, you want to be able to perform it under any circumstances with any modifications to it or not. You want to make it harder for yourself in practice than it actually is in performance. So that when you get into performance, it's not, it's not as daunting as it would be if you were like barely working up to it. Like if you have to play a high passage, have it ready a whole step higher. And then when you go into performance and your physical abilities are diminished, and it's down a half step, then it's just right in your wheelhouse, it's ready to go. Uh, same thing with tempo. If it's a slow passage, play it slower. If it's a fast passage, play it quicker. And then again, when you're in performance and you're, you're slightly diminished, you have like the way it is written, the way it's marked, the way it's supposed to be performed is well within your wheelhouse. Um, and then the other side of that is mental preparation. Um, it's like, what are you going to do when you show up on stage? Because it's different being on stage than being in the practice room. It always is, and there's not really a way around it. But there are a few things that I found that I can do before performing that help me. So one thing that I like to do is if I have a hard performance, I have a, like a schedule going in of how I'm preparing for this. And one thing I really like to do is like a day or two before the, before the performance, I don't touch it. I like I, I'm ready to go like three days before, and then I just I drop. I drop the I drop the piece. I don't pick it up again until I get on stage. I don't try and like work hard sections right before because like you can drive yourself nuts when you can drive yourself absolutely bonkers if you try and like, fix one section right before the concert. So give yourself that space to sort of step away from the music. Not step away from the music in like an expressive sense, but step away from the music in terms of like a technical sense. Um, and the other thing that I like to do is I like to do a bit of a grounding meditation, uh, say 10 minutes before I walk onto the stage. Um, and so I'll literally just, just sit in a chair and make sure that my feet are flat on the ground, my head is held up high, and I just walk myself through a couple of breathing, just deep breathing exercises for, I don't know, I set a timer for like three to five minutes. And when I come out of that, I find myself just a little bit more relaxed, but no, like not too relaxed to perform, but relaxed in such a way that I don't have as many of the, the, the physical manifestations of stress that many of us have when we go on stage. Um, so, I mean, for example, there's sometimes, especially when playing solo, where I start shaking on stage. Uh, and doing this sort of an exercise beforehand really helps mitigate that and can actually almost eliminate it. And that really sort of increases your physical ability. And it, so just, it, it, it raises the ceiling for what you can do. Um, yeah, if that answers your question, I so. All right, anyone else? Okay. All right, so I have uh, just one more little thing here that I wanted to talk about. And I started talking about this in answering Cole's question. Um, so when you're trying to like work on something, this is like how to approach something that's really difficult. You get a piece of music and you say, Oh my God, I don't know how I'm going to play that. Uh, so my example of this was the beginning of Ravel's Panic Concerto, which I confided in. 
um, in the handout. So you get this piece of music, and it's just like, all right, this is really hard. There's so many things that can go wrong here. What do I do? How do I make this work for me? So the first thing that I tried to do was find some way in which I could work the technique without actually working on the accent. So I chose a flow study from one of Chris Gecker's books. And this study sounds like this. It's never happened, right? than it is in performance. For example, if you know, I'm working on just one here, like be able to learn it both really slow and faster than the printed tempo, so that like any tempo is doable. You can do it no matter what the conductor throws at you, no matter what stresses are happening. And then when you get into something that's sort of in the middle, that's in the pocket, so to speak, it just feels that much easier. Um, anyway, that's sort of all the way through my lecture now. So. Uh, Cole, would you like to play some classical over here? Yeah. Right. Do we have questions about um, thus far? Comments? Make sure um, that uh, we can um, not be hidden by the stand. So if you want to come right over here, yeah. and then uh, Cole can be there with the stand where it was. Okay, yeah, well, I'll, uh, I'm just I'll thinking just visually. Yeah. Because I'm just going to have to read this out and work this piece up. What was it? I haven't worked this one up, so I'm just going to okay. read it off. Okay. Yep, that's fine. I could have given you this one. I do have a question um, uh, from Jalen. He's yeah. not able to make it. Um, and he was wondering, in, while you guys are transitioning, uh, he was wondering, uh, so what's the most beneficial concept, quote, that you took from school with you into the real world? Oh, that's kind of a tough one. Um, it's, it's hard to know for sure, honestly, because of COVID right now, there isn't that much of a real world in terms of the performance world at the moment. But I think there, there, there are a few things. Um, 
one is that every performance opportunity is important. There's not really such a thing as like, they're, they're, you're not going to get to a performance that's going to not benefit you. Um, the other thing is like, really make sure you are cultivating your relationships in school because basically everyone that I that is professional contact for me now is someone that I have either studied with, someone that has been a colleague of mine in school, or someone that I otherwise met through a school function. Um, or whether it was school or some other educational pattern. Um, the one other thing is, is like, you know, again, as I said, every performance opportunity is important. Every rehearsal is important. Take every opportunity you have to better yourself, to make sure that you can do whatever it is you want to be able to accomplish on the school. And school is a really great time for that because it's, I mean, school is tricky because they, they ask you to do a lot of things. They take a lot of classes, do a lot of homework, do a lot of rehearsals. And, but still, there's almost more time in school where you have um, the ability to practice like, a bit more than you do otherwise. Um, I know, like I know for me right now, I'm actually having more trouble finding the practice time now that I'm not in school than when I was in school. So it's just hard to believe that, isn't it? I know everybody, I, everybody <coughs> multiple people say that, right? And how many times have you heard that and say, yeah, right, I have no time. It seems like it couldn't be true, but <laughs> Thomas it is. <laughs> See, when you're not in school, you have to pay for other things. <laughs> cool, awesome. I hope Jalen caught that. Yeah. Yeah, if you need me to write any of that down, so I'd like to. Yeah. Yeah. All right. There we go. Um, we're going to start at the beginning. We're going to so we're going to talk a little bit about phrasing. So I just want to hear you play. Um, and just to clarify, uh, uh, share what piece you're playing. Okay. So I have with me on stage Cole Orla, who is preparing the Alexander Pavlova. Uh, and I am going to sort of try and illustrate some of the concepts that I talked about with you earlier in the lecture through his performance of this. So I'm just going to have you play from the beginning to the end, just however you normally would. And if you could make sure to be up over this way, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Actually, this G note here, which is sort of not intuitive because it's not actually a half step resolution, mm -hmm. it's a whole step. Okay. But that's a suspension mm -hmm. into that, into that, into that. So if I were to play that passage, see if I can do it justice. <laughs> Across the entire passage than just individual. Yeah. 
Um, so that's something that I think I actually might like. Um, so uh, I'd like to hear you also play, uh, starting at the Allegro B, I'd just like to hear you play just a couple lines. Yeah, can you play that passage again? So uh, yeah. And why don't you play those into action? Yeah, why don't you play just from the beginning to A uh, one more time. Thank you. 
So there's a way to connect that just a little bit more. Like, I mean, you really can't take away the like blurry distance. Um, again, small talk, but again, it's really And there's one more passage a little bit later in this universe. Plenty of steam to get to the end. Um, the one other thing, and then we're just about out of time, but I would actually consider a little bit more intensity for this entire passage. It almost felt too much too serene. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think it's I think you're in good shape with this. And I'm looking forward to hearing you play the whole thing. So thanks for playing for me today, Paul. So let's uh, wrap it up with some final questions, uh, comments, feedback. Well, but I have a question or two for you. What are you taking into your practice room from the awesome points that Nick provided today about musicianship, about uh, really approaching your solo work uh, with musicianship in mind? What are your takeaways? It can be as simple as one word. Go ahead, Harrison. The tension points you took yeah, away? Yeah, thinking of uh, listening to what I know the monitor after the music that is all the way up to that solo. Yeah, cool. Go ahead, Michael. I like the feedback from the library and like sending the tempos or like uh, I feel like that's when I do it after and then I like to do it all the whole setup and higher. Yeah. I, I like that. That's that awesome. active experimentation. The one other thing that could be helpful too is play it on a different instrument. Mm -hmm. Like if you're playing something on, on a C trumpet, bring it to B flat and uh, it will feel higher even though it's not this longer instrument you're playing higher fingering, so to speak. And then when you get back to the C trumpet, it'll, it'll just fit like a little bit nicer, especially if you're playing with the high passage for orchestra. Mm -hmm. I did that with, with the bar track and for orchestra. And that's like a little bit of that too. So, uh, yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah, just with that one passing on back to the approach of all of the different, all of the different ways to go about it. Based on all of those things. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. really, really the end result. Who would think making things difficult makes things easy, right? <laughs> so important. Other thoughts? Well, we're gonna have, um, go ahead, Gabe. I like just getting really personal with whatever producer trying to put whatever they're working on performing and singing it and turning it the whole thing says, just singing it and that the trumpet is, it's, it is a piece of metal, but 
Um, for those, uh, uh, the comment was made about uh, the extension, the trumpet being an extension of the voice and very personal. Excellent. Well, Nicholas, thank you so much. Thank you. Nice job, Cole. <laughs> so thank you guys for joining virtually. If you have any follow-up questions, uh, follow questions or comments, feel free to message me. Um, and I would be happy to provide uh, Nicholas's information for you as well. Um, but next week, uh, we're inviting Dr. Uh, Raquel Samoya from University of North Texas, and she's gonna be visiting virtually. So we'll have another hangout, and you guys are all welcome to join. I'll give you the information um, on the same Zoom link, same time, same place, um, and another guest. So. Uh, you guys, and continue, happy 10th week of school. Grab a piece of candy, get your t-shirt, have a great week. Thanks, guys. Great to see you all. Bye, Lou. Bye, Danny. Rachel, great to see you. It's your solo. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Great to see you. Thanks, Oren, for coming. Thanks, Will. Hey, grab. Oh. Hey, happy birthday. Thank you. What, hey, Gabe. The, uh, the yeah, let me get that for you. Bye, Will. Good to see you.